Welcome to our uh, week six uh, lecture videos and I trust that you'll keep up with your reading, your Roberts study questions and your uh, sermon responses. Uh, so far so good. Uh, just about all of you are keeping up with all that and I've been encouraged reading and, and your responses and seeing your answers and and uh, again want to emphasize you can feel free to contact me if there's any way I can help you or or uh, respond to any question or concern you might have. Uh, so let's get right into talking about uh, Paul's letters or the Pauline epistles. And uh, we'll start with the letter to the Romans um, in regards to the letter to the Romans. And, and as we've been doing, we will give some quick key themes as well as talk through the outlines um, of these books as our class is just an overview. And so uh, I want to make sure you get the information you need um, in an overview sense in regards to these books of the Bible. So we'll begin with Romans, the letter to the Romans. And the introductory material uh, dates it about the mid-50s uh, A.D. And um, the author is Paul as he declares himself being as such. And the purpose is to explain the gospel in relation to... Um, Jesus salvific, salvific, or Jesus, the actions of Jesus' salvation on behalf of all creation, and also how Jews and Gentiles are both to be a part of one people of God through Jesus, and a sustained and coherent statement of the gospel. F.F. F. Bruce points this out as a follow-up to the gospels themselves to make certain uh, that the early church was clear on exactly what the gospel is. And of course, we have that great exposition throughout the book of Romans explaining sin and salvation, um, that all of us have fallen short and that our only hope is in God and his goodness by what he's accomplished in Jesus Christ. And for the early church, these issues dealt with the understanding as uh, is mentioned there in uh, number three, letter B, that both Jews and Gentiles were to be a uh, part of the church. Um, in writing this, uh, you'll see Paul address the two groups, but we know that the gospel is not limited to ethnicity. And so we see that uh, this early church issue is dealt with uh, throughout the book of Romans and that we become children of God through Christ um, in spite of whether we're Jew or Gentile. So that issue of the two being together, that's a key in regards to the book of Romans. The key themes of the book of Romans are justification by grace alone through faith alone. Those are two vital instruments that are uh, necessary in regards to our salvation, that um, grace alone through faith alone, it's nothing we do, it's our faith uh, that is granted in what Christ has done through God's grace. and. He takes the first few chapters pointing out that all are sinners. Um, Paul uses uh, chapter 2 specifically to show that the Old Testament law cannot save either a Jew who thinks they're obeying it or a Gentile who's not even aware of it. And so it's not the law that saves people. Neither do works save people because if you were a Jew thinking you were just obeying the law, then that would be a salvation, salvation by works and not by grace. If you were a Gentile who was not aware of the law, you would have um, the excuse or the opportunity to say, hey, I was just doing good things. Um, I wasn't aware of the law. But that salvation is a changed heart and not works of the law. And that Jesus' atoning death, burial, and resurrection is God's plan of redemption. Not only is it God's plan of redemption, it's the only hope we have of redemption. So these are all key themes throughout the book of Romans. Um, continuing through with the key themes, there's a contrast between the two uh, human com uh, communities, one characterized by sin and guilt and the wrath of God and the other by grace and faith and the indwelled, the indwelling Holy Spirit. And uh, the two Adams are mentioned, um, Adam from creation and then Jesus being the second Adam. And it's not Jew versus Gentile, it's whether you know God's grace and live by faith according to the Spirit, or whether you're under sin and guilt and the wrath of God by 
not knowing of the grace of God through faith in Christ. Uh, God is sovereign in salvation. All that comes to us as a result of salvation is by God's doing. Sovereign meaning he's in complete control of the entire process. Um, chapter 8 deals with our life in the Spirit. We mentioned grace, faith, and the Spirit-indwelled life. And so the Holy Spirit impacts our heart and our life um, so that we live in line with uh, God's Spirit. And then, of course, our hope of a future glory and the fact that the gospel calls uh, believers to personal holiness, to mutual service to one another, to being good citizens, um, as well as a wholehearted neighborly love. And so we see those uh, final admonitions towards the end of the book of Romans, um, talking about how this gospel is lived out in our lives. Um, the general outline of the book is the introduction there in the first uh, 17 verses of chapter 1. Um, creation become, becomes unraveled by sin. Um, but beginning in chapter 3, towards the end of chapter 3, we see this restoration of creation that comes by grace through faith. And then creation's restoration, which is for both Jews and Gentiles, and it only happens as we come to the Lord Jesus Christ and we're saved by faith in him. And then the restoration of creation in the life of the individual believer. And that's those last few chapters that deal with how um, our lives live out that which God has done for us. And then the final chapter, or a little more than a chapter, is is um, Paul in regards to his ministry and some concluding uh, words. And remember, these are letters that are written to groups of people. Some of his letters uh, later on we'll mention that were uh, written to Titus and Timothy are called pastoral epistles. But these letters were written to church groups, Romans, um, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. And so um, we just want to understand that there's also a personal aspect in regards to these letters uh, that are included. So we see that as uh, the outline. Uh, following the book of Romans is the letters to the Corinthians. And there are two of these. In fact, the scripture seems to indicate that there's probably more than two, but we only have two by God's providence. We only have two in the New Testament um, that we know of today. And, and uh, so as we look at 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, uh, again, these are letters that are um, written by Paul. Uh, the key themes of uh, 1, Corinthi 1 Corinthians are the uh, different topics that Paul touches on um, that, are, that seem to be answering some of the Corinthians specific questions. And um, there are two overriding concepts that pervade Paul's instructions to the church, and that is wisdom and the new creation. The new creation being who we are in Christ, wisdom being that which God directs us in according to his wisdom, not according to the ways of the world, as to how we live as that new creation in Christ. Um, the themes continue in regards to living as this new creation in Christ, um, as I just mentioned. And uh, it's important, um, as you see here, especially on letter A, number three, that the ethical instructions in 1 Corinthians are based on the new creation. Um, and that's the, the last day's language that's used. But they are um, related specifically back to the gospel um, in Romans chapter 1 through 11. There's no uh, discontinuity between the letters of Paul, and uh, that would be expected coming from a single author. But his ethical instruction in First and Second Corinthians, as we saw at the end, or the latter half of the book of Romans, living by the Spirit, um, relate to the gospel message that's um, emphasized and portrayed through the book of Romans. And so that, that ethical connection is there between First and Second Corinthians and um, the book of Romans. Then uh, the outline of the book of First Corinthians, or the letter, first letter to the Corinthians, is the introduction. We see the reproof of their sin, dealing with the issues that were bringing division. And the problem stemmed from a worldly wisdom versus a godly wisdom. And we know that in First Corinthians, the Bible makes it clear that God's wisdom makes the world's wisdom look like foolishness. And so we see that contradiction there in what the world would think is wise is actually foolish. 
in regards to um, God's wisdom. And then uh, as a result of these issues, uh, there's obvious immaturity, there's loss of reward, there's a judgment that they're passing on each other. And then Paul deals with the solution to these issues. And um, part of this reproof comes from their lack of discipline in the church. And church discipline is key to a body of Christ, uh, each of us holding one another accountable uh, to, to our life in Christ um, through our love for one another, because we should want each other to live in a way that would be pleasing to God. Um, Paul deals with um, another issue of uh, there was some kind of uh, litigation, legal action between church members, um, and then there's also a lack of uh, physical purity that Paul deals with um, in regards to these. And so in reply to their questions, Paul deals with celibacy and marriage. Um, he deals with some concerns about meat sacrifice to idols, um, whether that's something we should eat or not. Um, he talks about uh, roles of public worship, the role of women, the Lord's Supper, uh, the use and implementation of the spiritual gifts. And then in 1 Corinthians 15 is, a, is a, probably one of the well-known passages in regards to the resurrection. We know 1 Corinthians 13 is right there in the midst of chapters 12 and 14 that are the spiritual gifts and the greatest of the spiritual gifts is love 1 Corinthians 13 the love chapter 1 Corinthians 15 Paul uh, drives home what the gospel truly is and is based upon uh, because of the victory that comes in the resurrection of Christ and again Paul concludes with some practical matters and some personal greetings and a benediction um, as we mentioned before these are letters that are written uh, from person to people. And so uh, it's not unusual to have, have that personal touch involved there. In 2 Corinthians, um, again, the author is Paul. And by the purpose of 2 Corinthians, Paul is defending his apostles, apostleship and ministry. So in, in response to some of the stands that he took, um, it would be easy for some maybe who didn't know him to question, well, who is this guy and how does he have the right to tell us or teach us anything? Um, that Paul exemplifies the gospel ministry in suffering just as Christ suffered. And he reminds them of uh, their giving for the Jerusalem church. So um, that giving is an aspect in, in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 the idea of giving in regards to the grace that's been given to us, but he's talking about monetary giving for the help and the benefit of others. And uh, then addresses the remaining uh, rebellious uh, members. But um, there are some keys here and there's a lot of narrative context in 2 Corinthians, um, but there's some vital aspects of Paul's relationship with the church, those whom he knew personally, uh, from his second missionary journey, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, uh, where he met Aquila and Priscilla. And then on his third missionary journey, while at Ephesus, Paul most likely wrote um, a previous letter. That was the one I had mentioned uh, before, and um, we don't have it in our New Testament uh, canon today, um, but uh, dealt specifically with some of the connections we can see between um, First and Second Corinthians. Um, the church uh, obviously was open to advice and seems to have been seeking Paul's counsel on advice. Uh, Paul intended to go to Macedonia and Corinth um, and then to Jerusalem to deliver uh, this offering, but prior to this sent Timothy. And um, from Ephesus, Paul what is, wrote what is referred to as the severe letter to Corinth, but um, Titus apparently visited the church and brought encouraging news to Paul that they had turned and were once again retained their loyalty and had dealt with the one who had done so much hurt and damage. Um, some key themes, as I mentioned earlier, the sufferings of Christ, which are also experienced by believers. These are opportunities for God to work in us. Um, also the new covenant ministry. Um, any of those who came out of uh, Judaism, um, this would have a special meaning to them that that the covenant uh, was to be written on their hearts. And the covenant is one of eternal glory that shares in the sufferings of Christ uh, 
and allows us to be transformed into his image. Um, and that there's no reason to fear uh, because uh, this body, this physical body we have, which is uh, wasting away, is not our eternal home. We have an eternal home um, with Christ. And uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 deals with the gospel ministry, and it's key that as the apostle deals with this, even in dealing with all their shortcomings and issues and challenges that they had, that they understand while they're here as Christians, as followers of Christ, that they are to be ambassadors. That's the key metaphor that's used by Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 to describe the fact that each one of us as followers of Christ, each one who have been called and through faith by God's grace have come to know Jesus Christ, that we are now ambassadors. We are the ones who are here as representatives, just as nations in our world today send um, envoys or ambassadors to other nations to officially represent so that we too as believers in Christ are official uh, representatives here as witnesses for Jesus Christ. So that's a key to know of those ambassadors uh, for Christ that the Apostle Paul mentions in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Continuing through the book, um, the fact that uh, believers who do fall into sin have an example of grief and repentance, and, and in the Christian faith and in the Christian walk, repentance is always the goal as we're growing in our faith, that we, when we are confronted with sin, are quick to turn away from that sin, uh, to confess before God, and to um, renew our life in the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And um, that New Testament giving, as I mentioned, chapter 8 and 9, um, that New Testament giving of money is um, a reaction that's founded, or a response, or an act of obedience that's founded upon the gospel itself, because God gave to us his son, Jesus Christ. So for us to give, especially to give money in response to helping someone who's in need, um, that should be something that we are quick and ready to do as God leads us. Um, and then the last few chapters, Paul uses sarcasm to point out the foolishness of the false teachers um, in regards to earthly wisdom and godly wisdom and those who would try to lead believers away from the true gospel. Um, so that's uh, 2 Corinthians. We move forward into the letter to the Galatians. And um, there's a key historical figure that Paul uses in Galatians, and we'll see this. And hopefully you can tie this into what you read in um, Robert's book, and specifically his study questions that were tied to Galatians chapter 3. And so uh, Paul, again, is the author, probably written in the late 40s A.D., and the purpose is to explain how the gospel is both for Jews and Gentiles, especially in light of Peter and Paul's confrontation in Galatians chapter 2. If you remember from the book of Acts, um, Peter's ministry uh, was led to Cornelius, a Gentile, um, to for God to turn his heart and to change his heart to realize that the gospel was for both Jew and Gentile. And then in Paul's conversion and then being rejected uh, so often by those in Judaism from which he was raised, um, he sensed God's call and push to minister to, um, to the Gentiles. So that the gospel is not just limited to Jews because all of the original uh, followers of Christ came out of Judaism. And so you could see where that would easily cause a misunderstanding. But, but let's make it clear, as the New Testament makes it clear, that the gospel is for both Jews and Gentiles. Uh, key themes, again, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That our justification before God comes only as a result of faith in what Jesus Christ has done. And, and that ties in with that Galatians chapter 3 passage from your Robert's study guide, um, that the purpose of the law, then, as Paul goes on to explain, is to turn us towards Christ, to show us where we've done wrong. Um, the results of salvation then bring us to that life as a new creation in Christ, um, as is mentioned a number of times, for it is not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me, the Apostle Paul exclaims in uh, Galatians. And then Abraham. Abraham is that example. If you remember, again, 
let's tie it back to Robert's study questions and touching, connecting it with the covenant that God made with Abraham, that the reason Abraham was counted as righteous is because of his faith. Yes, he acted in obedience, but obedience alone does not save you. It's only by faith in the grace of what God has done in Jesus Christ. So Abraham is this key example that demonstrates that both salvation and sanctification, which is the life we live as we are maturing in the faith, is always been by grace through faith. So Abraham, even before Jesus Christ came along, was reckoned as righteous because of his faith. And that's what's important to remember. And I trust um, that we can understand that and see that tied to what Robert's connection was between the covenant with Abraham and the references and questions he made to Galatians chapter 3. And then uh, the outline of the book, we have the, the greeting, which is typical in Paul's letters. We have the denunciation of those who would preach some other kind of gospel or would add something to this idea that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And then Paul defends his apostleship, his, his ministry of being one um, sent by God as uh, foundational to his ministry. And then the doctrinal defense of justification by faith, that, that our vindication is justification by faith, and uh, that that's our only way to stand um, right before God. And that the purpose of the law is to point us in that direction and that his appeal is concerning justification by faith. Again, tied in with uh, the covenant to Abraham and the fact that Abraham was reckoned as righteous because of his faith. Yes, he was obedient, but it was his faith, his trust in God and what God was telling him that uh, counted him righteous before God. Um, Paul defends the uh, practice of Christian liberty in our freedom in Christ versus the law and our freedom in Christ as opposed to our license to do anything. Um, you know, so many people think, well, if God's going to forgive me, then I can just do whatever I want. No, if you're just sinning any way that you want, then you're still not free. It's Christ that liberates you or gives you the liberty uh, from sin. And then our liberty to love. Because we know the love of God in us, we can then share that love with others. And then his uh, conclusion, authenticating the, uh, the letter itself to the Galatians, um, his condemnation of the Judaizers, those were the ones who were trying to add elements of keeping the law on top of uh, what Jesus Christ had done. And uh, then he closes, and you see the credits there. Um, from the adaptation of this outline. So that's the book of Galatians. And the two purposes of the law that Paul mentions have to do with teaching Israel and us that all of mankind is sinful. All of us are sinners. Like we mentioned in the book of Romans, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So that by the law, it shows us where we come up short. In, on God's standards, and thus we are only saved uh, by faith uh, through grace in Christ. And so the law to the Jew teaches them and shows them where they've fallen short because they thought they could be saved by just keeping the law. And to the Gentiles, to the rest of us, um, even if we're not aware of the law, by the law we become aware that, hey, I couldn't keep that strictly by my own obedience. So that promise of faith, again, tying it in with Robert's study questions and God's dealing with Abraham, that he was reckoned as righteous through faith. And the law reveals that not only can all of mankind, both Israel, Jew and Gentile, cannot keep the law, but that um, both are only in a right standing before God by faith in what he's done in Christ by taking him at his word. Uh, the next is the letter to the Ephesians. And uh, Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, uh, again, written by Paul in the early 60s AD, with the purpose of teaching, teaching the mystery of God's will, 
which unites all things in Christ. And specifically that Paul wanted to explain how the Gentile Ephesian Christians can be and are part of the one people of God with the Jews. So there aren't two peoples, of, two peoples of God, two distinct groups. You don't come to God through Judaism and then separately come to God through Christianity. No, there's only one group, and that one group is united in what Christ has done. And so to these who perhaps would have seen themselves as outsiders because they weren't of Jewish heritage, Paul's saying, no, our only connection to God is through his son, Jesus Christ, whether Jew or Gentile. And so uh, the key themes here are the fact that we are in Christ and that in the Ephesians, Paul is writing to them to help them understand their salvation, their unity, their mission, um, uh, recognizing the spiritual battle. And all of these are part of the realities of union with Christ. Um, but also this union with Christ brings a unity of the church. For you see, if I'm united to Christ and you're united to Christ and anyone else is united to Christ, then by the fact that we're all united to Christ, we're united to one another. And that's the unity of the church and how we as the body of Christ are unified because of Christ. And so this union with Christ is crucial, whether Jew or Gentile, and that Understanding the way the church works, Paul uses uh, different metaphors. Um, he talks about the body. He talks about the building. He talks about the temple. He talks about the bride. He talks about the new humanity for those who are in Christ, the fact that we're a family, and he concludes with a spiritual battle. But what unites us in Christ is all that Paul does through the Spirit. It's the spirit that unites us. It's the spirit uh, that uh, brings us together in one body. It's the spirit uh, that prepares us for the bride of Christ. It's the spirit that helps us in this spiritual battle. So that's a key phrase in the Ephesians is the fact that it's through uh, the spirit. The Uh, pardon the abrupt uh, interruption there, uh, but that brings us to the conclusion of the first of the Pauline epistles, and there's another uh, section that we'll go through, but uh, just want to again emphasize that you keep up with your reading, with your study questions, with your sermon responses, and again encourage you to feel free to contact me if there's any way that I can help you or be of benefit to you in this course or in any other way. Perhaps you have some questions that have arisen as a result of what you're reading or what we're talking about, um, and it would be more along the lines of something that sparked a question or discussion that you would like to have. Please don't hesitate to contact me. I'm here uh, to help you and hopefully to encourage you in your journey um, with Christianity. And so trust God's blessings on you until we uh, meet again uh, through these lecture videos. God bless you.